All right, so let's uh, think about <clears throat> uh, life under what, what I call life under Romanism, how things now began to move. And uh, th so this, the first thing is uh, the establishment of ca Catholicism. What, is, what, is, what do I mean by establishment of Catholicism? You know, Catholicism means uh, universal. And so, the, so as, after you have the seat of government in Rome with the Pope, then you have a universal church, so to speak. That doesn't mean that everybody followed it because uh, there, are, there are a lot of places that have, uh, matter of fact, I've got a, a book that has some letters in it that were written uh, by uh, some of the bishops back to the Pope at Rome in about the eighth century. And they had traveled to England and other places like that. And they said, there are, there are Christians here who don't recognize the Pope. They don't follow the sacraments. They don't uh, worship as we instruct them to worship. They claim that they're Christians and Christians only, and they worship in very simple fashion. And they were just puzzled by all of that. So there are always these kind of peoples that they would find here and there. They're not necessarily pockets of resistance, but they became resistant to the Roman domination. But that's what we talk about, or that's what I mean by the establishment of Catholicism. And it was really a, an evolution of, of a period of time. And so as you see, the, the first pope came to being in 606. We saw that last week. And so everything is going to be evolving and very rapidly at this particular point. Now, one of the things that caused, uh, at least as far as my reading is concerned, that, that Catholicism would be established, but it was because that there were so many, what they called heresies here and there in the, in the religious world. And so in order, to, in order to answer those or put those down, uh, they felt like that they, they needed a more centralized form of government. Now what's, I want you to think about this because this is how our founding fathers looked at it as well. I want you to think about What's the problem with that? So they, okay, so we have in the New Testament, as we've already seen, every congregation is autonomous, self-governing, as Acts 14, 23, as well as other passages. But because there are so many errors and, and doctrinal her heresies, they thought, many of them thought, okay, what we need to do is we need to have a centralized form of government. And they, they opted for that because they wanted to answer the, heretics of the world. So what's the, what's the problem here? Besides the fact that it's uh, unauthorized and there's no authority, but let's think in practical terms, what practically can go wrong here? What, what practical problems do you see with centralizing any form of government? Take, take too much power, it's out of authority, yes. Yeah, and that's kind of how I'm thinking. That is to say, all right, Let's say that, okay, to protect doctrinal purity, let's have a centralized world government of the church. Well, the problem there is if you have the centralized government and the leaders of it going off, then everything is going to go. Everything is going to follow. So the Roman church, so the Roman Catholic church settled that issue by putting out their emissaries the bishops and archbishops all over the world, and so they would keep an eye on things. And that's right. So they, but they had to receive all of the authority from Rome. And that's right. So they, that's how they. So you have to have a watchful eye everywhere, and that's what we're going to find being the case. So th that's the practical problem here. So if we're going to centralize the form of government in the church, if the centralized form of government and the leaders go off, then the entire, the entire cake is going to be spoiled. Uh, the wisdom of God in the local church autonomy is when one church goes off, the other ones, you know, they're not necessarily going to go that direction. Now, they may because of influence, as we see going on in our country right now, but it's not, it's not going to be any mandates coming down from, from Nashville, Tennessee to the churches of Christ. So be that as it may, that's what was taking place in, with the centralized form of government. So now let's look at what is called sacerdotalism. What is sacerdotalism? What is sacerdotalism? Priesthood. It refers to priests. Sacerdotal refers to the priest. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to see some very interesting things here regarding 
the movement of the Roman church away from, away from the truth. This is 1 Peter 2 and verses 4 through 5, and we'll look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 also. So in 1 Peter 2, let's uh, begin here. Uh, we'll just start at verse 1 and go down through verse 5. Putting away, therefore, all wickedness, all guile, hypocrisies, envies, evil speakings, as newborn babes long for the spiritual milk, which is without guile, that you may grow thereby unto salvation, if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Unto whom coming a living stone, rejected indeed of men, but with God elect precious, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So Paul, uh, Peter writes to the Christians here, and he's writing to those who are in of the dispersion, Christians of the dispersion in Asia Minor. And he says that they're all priests before God. Go down to verse 9. But you are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When time passed, were no people, but now are the people of God. So what do we have happening here? So we have, in the New Testament, all Christians are priests, and we, we refer to it as the priesthood of all believers. All Christians are priests. However, in the Roman church, they borrow the ideas from two different areas in which they wanted to have a priesthood that was separate and distinct from the so-called laity. Where were those sources from which they borrowed the priesthood concept? Number one, the Old Testament, Judaism in the Old Testament. So if we, if we have a hard time understanding that the Old Testament law is gone and nailed to the cross and the Old Testament system is defunct, then we're going to have a hard time keeping out of that and not applying that to the New Testament. So they had a priesthood in the Old Testament. Where else did they have a priesthood besides the Old Testament? Idolatry, paganism, pagan. All pagan religions have and have had a separate and set-apart priesthood. So from paganism, the pagan pressures and Jewish pressures and the, and the failure to recognize the distinction between the New Testament and Old Testament meant that they were going to go to the Old Testament and to pagan concepts in order to bring these ideas into the church. And that's what happened. So what do we have uh, today? Let's just think about today. One of, the, one of the primary problems in my estimation that I see in the church is the fact that we have allowed the world, denominationalism, Judaism, the world to impact us and, and change not only the way we preach, but the way we uh, worship and the way we conduct ourselves in the church. All of these things have been really changed from the New Testament standard. And you can see that. You can see that, can't you? I mean, as, we, as you look around in the religious world, so um, all of these all of these things that are not New Testament, where do they come from? Basically, either paganism or the world and Judaism. And that's what happened here in the early centuries. So sacerdotalism refers to a priesthood. So along with the priesthood, we're going to have something else that is very, very important to the Roman Catholic Church. And that is if you have a priesthood, the priests themselves are going to have to have um, a, they have a special connection with God, and your duty is to go through the priest. That's the way it was in the Old Testament. And that's the way it is in the Roman church. You have to go through the priest. So they not only have a separate priesthood, but the very purpose of it is to establish that we have a clergy versus laity, and laity must go through the clergy. That's putting it mildly, go through the priests. Otherwise, why have a priest if they're, if they're not going to be having any kind of authority or power or any kind of um, avenue with God that you don't have? Why, ha why have a priesthood? There's no, there's no reason to have it. So that would naturally follow. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you know what? We, we kind of fall into that trap. You know, we, we allow the priests to take care of it. I'll go to my priest, and, and it, that's a natural outcome of it. And that is, we just let our lives go, and then if we, want, if we want to have satisfaction somehow with God, then we go to the priest, and he'll take care of it for us. And that's, so here's what, um, this is F.W. Maddox. He writes this. Here's something interesting. We're coming to the Lord's Supper and baptism, as you can see, but he's talking about the administration of the Lord's Supper and baptism, therefore became the sole privilege of the bishop. As the bishop enlarges his responsibilities, he authorized elders perform these services. But what, what, we have authorization coming from a bishop, coming from the Catholic head. The services then become, became official in nature and could only be performed by a specially ordained clergy. And so we have, along with this, ceremonialism. There's no reason to have a priesthood unless they have some kind of special abilities that you do not have. And that's, so that's what's going to happen. So the priests are the ones going to be able to ordain how services are going to be conducted. So far off the beam now from 1 Peter chapter 2 as well as other texts that it is very alarming, isn't it? Any thoughts on that? Any comments? Sherry? You know, uh, what you said really strikes a lot of notes with uh, our founders and not only founders of the America, but they, they base their concepts of freedom and the structure of government to, to enable us to have freedom on the congregational authority that people had as they, in the Reformation as they moved out of Catholicism and they wanted to have only the congregation, that is a local church having autonomy, it's local government, that's how they set up, structured our government in that same fashion. That is to say that the local governments were to be self-governing. But there's a huge frightening impact or frightening aspect of that, and that is what? Freedom is frightening. Freedom is frightening because you're responsible yourself. And people, you, uh, that, this is why John Adams would say, uh, the second president, he would say that we've had the most freedoms now in America since the time of Adam and Eve. People don't normally opt for freedom. People normally opt for some type of slavery or some kind of dependent system. Just think, for example, what would happen if they removed the healthcare system that we have in place right now, said, everybody, you're on your own. Well, we, no, people want to have a dependency. Okay, I, you know, they, that, that would just, that would blow everybody's minds. They would not, they would, so how, how are we able to achieve those things? Right, so the same thing is true in religion. Same thing, congregational authority, congregational autonomy is in many respects a frightening thing. People like, the comfort of having, okay, the priest says this, the priest says that, he does this, and he tells me I'm all right, and that's it, yes, sir. Right, yeah, that's right. First Peter, uh, First Timothy 2, 5, the passage I mentioned a moment ago, we're, that's right, one mediator between God and man. So all of that, of course, is, is sacerdotalism, and so let's, let's move on from that priesthood. Now let's consider how baptism is going to be handled. So... <clears throat> Okay, looking at what we've just seen, what do you, how do you suppose this is going to start playing out regarding baptism? Just common sense now. Natural conclusion, if you're going to have to have priests to do all of these things, how is baptism going to be administered? It's going to have to be done by the priest. It cannot be done by just any individual. Do we still have those same thoughts today? Sure we do. Even in the Lord's church, people say, well, I, you know, um, I want to be baptized, but, you know, maybe we better, maybe we better get the preacher to do it. <laughs> right. It's, but that that's, comes from all of that worldview that the priest is going to do it. So the priests were the ones who administered it. So if that's going to take place, here's, here's, this is once again from Maddox. He said, the act itself became an elaborate ceremony where the candidate renounced the devil, had salt sprinkled on his head, and after his immersion received milk and honey. 
as a token of entering the spiritual promised land. So they made it a great big ceremonial priesthood idea. Not to say that we should not make a big deal of baptism. We should, and I think that's, of course, it is an entrance into the kingdom of heaven. But be that as it may, this, the pomp and circumstance that goes along with a lot of the Catholic practices, uh, that has become, that's become pretty standard. And so many people today, they are afflicted by the idea that they want pomp and circumstance. And they are, they are really dissatisfied or unsatisfied with simplicity of worship, simplicity of baptism, simplicity of these things. They want to come in with stained glass windows. They like the crosses. They like the music. They like the choirs. They like the smoke. They, they like all of that stuff, and we've become addicted to it. That, what, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Dave. That's correct. Yeah, and they don't know how to change, but also they become where they like it and they don't feel that we've, we're really uh, successfully worshiping God if we don't have it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a very common, common stock. So af after, that, uh, after that baptism, with the, let's, the, there's another baptism we need to bring in here, and that, of course, would be infant baptism. So we're kind of recapping here. Infant baptism... Originally, originally, in about the fourth century, it was occasionally before 325, but not until after Augustine in 450, who was that to be a fifth century man, Augustine did infant baptism become commonplace because Augustine was so adamant to teach and so widely influential to teach that people are born in sin. So if that be the case, then since Augustine teaches you're born in sin and baptism remits sin, then you're going to have to baptize the baby. So here's how the history of it goes. Number one, they had deathbed baptisms occasionally prior to. But it, show, it was also showing it was for the remission of sins because people on the deathbed, they needed baptism. But if baptism is unessential to salvation, there'd be no reason to go to someone's deathbed and put water on them in any fashion whatsoever. Number three, that Infants needed to be baptized because it shows it was for the remission of sins and infants are born in sin. According to Augustine, we got to apply that. And then later, of course, that became, as I've mentioned before, very distasteful. And therefore, we have an empty ceremony. Then I added to that, we have sprinkling. That was development because that was how they did it on sick people only instead of immersing them on the deathbed or in an emergency case, and they wouldn't even say, it's an emergency case to sprinkle water. Well, after a while, if it's an emergency case, that would be good enough for everyone. So the first case, a known case of this was a man by the name of Novation in Rome, and that was in 251 AD. So that's how baptism progressed, or digressed, I should say, and went downhill. Plus, we have the priesthoods in charge of it. So that's what happened with baptism. Any, any thoughts? Go ahead. All right, let's look at the Lord's Supper here for a moment. So as you can see, the same thing is the case regarding the Lord's Supper. Let's look at, for example, um, let's just glance at this passage. This is Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And just, uh, we're just thinking about the wording of the text and how uh, the Lord's Supper was inaugurated, instituted by our Lord on the last night before his crucifixion. This is beginning in verse 14. When the hour was come, Luke 22, verse 14, he sat down and the apostles with him, and he said, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, all shall not eat it, but until it shall be fulfilled, or I shall not eat it until it shall be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He received a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I shall not drink from henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, gave to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And the cup in like manner after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, even that which is poured out for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrays me is on the table. So let's think about a couple of 
uh, thoughts here. Let's, uh, what is the main thought? We have it right here on the table. And this is, that is uh, the main word here is what? Remembrance. It's, it's a memorial. It's a remembrance. And we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as well as chapter 16, that it was in Acts 20 and verse 7, it was done on a regular weekly basis. And our Lord instituted it here. And, as, and incidentally, as we participate in the Lord's Supper, our Lord tells us he's going, to, he's going to eat and drink at the table in the kingdom. Our Lord actually participates with us, so to speak, as, at the Lord's Supper. But that shows us also that we're in the kingdom, because he said it would be in the kingdom. And he had, and the Lord's table was in Corinth, so the kingdom was in Corinth. So the Lord's kingdom is here. He participates with us, spiritually speaking, and it's a memorial service. Now, that's how the New Testament outlines it. There are many other factors to it also, but uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as well as uh, Matthew chapter 26. But those, that being the main outline, I want you to think about how things began to devolve once again regarding the Lord's Supper. And this is interesting because they began to speak of the Lord's Supper, even in the time of Irenaeus. We learned he was in the second century. He said it was an offering just as the Jews offered incense. All right, let's stop there. But now here's, here's the reason why it's good, as Betsy was pointing out, stay with the wording of Scripture. It's not in the Scripture. Stay with the wording of Scripture. Is it, is it referred to as an offering? Not to my knowledge, I don't refer to, I don't think, I can't think of any text that refers to the Lord's Supper and the elements as an offering to God. I, don't, I can't think of any text uh, that Saul speaks. But nevertheless, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus, both in the second century, referred to the Lord's Supper as an offering. Now, that's a little different. I would not necessarily uh, jump up and down if someone said that, but I think, I think we're going in the wrong direction. I'll say that immediately, and we'll see how that goes. So then, uh, this is, uh, at first it was a sacrifice of man to God, but since it represented sacrifice of Christ, it became an offering of Christ to God. All right, so if it's an offering, but now it's an offering of Christ to God, what's the problem with that? Well, he only suffered once, and he offered himself once, and the book of Hebrews chapter 9 outlines that on a number of occasions, using the word once for all on several occasions, Hebrews 9 and Hebrews chapter 10. But now we're saying, well, it's an offering of Christ. So here's another one. This is from the third century. Cyprian, remember, he's from North Africa. He added the idea that the service reenacts the offering of Christ. That's how he put it. It reenacts the offering of Christ. Well, now, now we're into these waters that are far from the New Testament. And you see how it's just a small drift, an offering. Now it's a sacrifice. So we use the offering, we use the word sacrifice, and now it reenacts, reenacts the suffering of Christ. Well, all of that is way off base. There's no reenactment to it, but be that as it may, that's how they did it. It is this, the priest then takes the place of Christ, and he offers the body and blood of Christ. So Tertullian, fourth century, he said the elements were symbols but the Lord's Supper could be applied to the dead. I don't even know, and I'm not even sure what he meant by that. I thought, what does that mean? How can that be applied to the dead? I have no idea. Then we have Cyril of Jerusalem, who was in the fourth century. He was the first to ad advocate that the Eucharist, why do they call it a Eucharist, by the way? Why do they say Eucharist? Eucharist means give thanks. Eucharist, so the Greek word Eucharisteo is to offer thanks. So it's a Eucharist, it's a giving thanks. So he said it was the, the Eucharist had the power to help the dead. So he kind of followed Tertullian. Help the dead. How, so what, what's happening here to the idea of the Lord's Supper being a memorial? What's happening to it? Becoming a ceremony. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of catch all. All right, how can it be applied to the dead? The only way you can say such a thing is to think that it has some kind of magical power within and of itself. Well, what's wrong with that? 
There's nothing magical to it. Is, is there inherently in the bread and the fruit of the vine power? No. No. What, what passage would we think about? If you think if this got inherent power within it, then that's kind of where they're drifting with this. It has inherent power within itself. So you can live wrong and take that and it has some power to heal your sins. And that's, that all is so far off what we have in the New Testament. So to think that it has inherent power, it really becomes, as Sherry put it, a magical kind of idea. It's magical. And that's, what, that's how it became. Today, that's how it is considered in the Roman church. It's a magical thing. And that's why the priests themselves, kind of jumping ahead of myself here, are the ones who have the authority to give you the, the elements of the Lord's Supper, which they don't call the Lord's Supper anyway. They call it the what? Or the mass, mass. What is mass? It's a re-sacrifice of Christ. It's a re-sacrifice of Christ. So uh, this, you can see where this is, had, had come from. Then we have uh, Chrysostom, who was a fourth century preacher. He was a bishop at Constantinople, and he believed the idea of the sacrifice was in the communion. Then Augustine followed. He said the Lord's Supper is once again a sacrifice. Gregory the Great claimed to be the Pope. Remember that it came to Boniface. He said the sac it was here that the sacrifice of the Mass was fully established in Gregory the Great. So the whole picture that I want you to see is that it was an evolution of a movement that took it to this magical idea, and the mass is the re-sacrifice of Christ. So you can see how this, is, this has moved from first century simplicity to ceremonialism and magical thinking. You can see that. Yes, sir. Yeah, but, but yes, mass. So the, the word mass, uh, the idea is that you are re-sacrificing and re-crucifying the Messiah. That's what the idea of mass is. It's a re-sacrifice of Christ. Absolutely. So this is where our debaters have so many years and the debates with Catholics, we've, you know, we've always insisted, look here, re-sacrifice of Christ? Boy, they are so defensive of that, but that's exactly what they believe. And it shows us once again, Hebrews 9, that it is once for all he was sacrificed, but no, the mass. So when people, so when I, matter of fact, when I was a teenager, I remember I had, I grew up in, with Catholics and Mormons. And uh, so the, uh, I had had Catholic friends, they would invite me to their church and so forth. And um, they had to have mass on Saturday night, for example. Yeah, Saturday mass. Yeah, early, yeah. So I, 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 so I asked mom, I said, what, why? She said, well, Here's, here's the idea. So I went and kind of poked around and found out some answers on that. And so I, would, I went back and said, you know what? That's, uh, I, I didn't feel comfortable even attending with my friends on that one. I just thought, uh, you know, a re-sacrifice of Christ. That's not to say, I mean, I've attended Catholic funerals and so forth, and they still do the same thing there. So maybe I'm inconsistent on it, but I just didn't feel comfortable. I think, well, celebrating the death of Christ as re-sacrificing again, that is just like, uh-uh. And I just didn't feel comfortable with that at all. Because most people suppose the mass is simply the Catholic word for communion. No, 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 no. No, it means re-crucify the Messiah over and over again. That's what it means. So, <clears throat> so then we have Eusebius, fourth century Christian, rejected the idea that actual blood was in the Lord's Supper. So what is he answering? Now, he rejected, he was a main church historian, but now what do you suppose is the doctrine that he was answering here? Say again. Yet that the, the fruit of the vine is blood. The fruit of the vine is actually blood. And that is the doctrine of transubstantiation. That is, so it's a miracle performed every time that a priest says the prayer over the mass and that is a miracle is performed, and it actually, it looks like grape juice, it tastes like grape juice, but it's blood. It looks like bread, it tastes like bread, it smells like bread, you bought it at the store, but it's actually flesh. 
That's the belief of the Roman church, transubstantiation. So Eusebius was saying, no, it's not that way. And it shows us that this was something that was developing also, that it was transubstantiation. Okay, so here's another one. Origen, another fourth century Christian said, you know, these elements are only symbols. And he argued vehemently that they're just symbols, which is, I believe he was correct on that. But it does show that it was not crystallized into a formal doctrine yet. So then we finally have John of Damascus. And this was in the eighth century. Pope said, he says, this is a literal change of the elements from bread and fruit of the vine into flesh and blood. And it became a mainstay Catholic doctrine, and that is transubstantiation. And so it's kind of interesting that in 496, one of the bishops of Rome was against transubstantiation. They argued about it and argued about it, but it finally came to pass that transubstantiation is the doctrine that is there today. And that's how it came about. The first to really stand by it was John of Damascus in the 8th century. Any thoughts on that? Any questions? So that's how the Lord's Supper moved along. So now let's look at the idea of a sacrament. What exactly is a sacrament then? What is a sacrament? Sacred event. That's a dictionary definition, but that's not the Catholic definition. So <clears throat> the Catholic definition Sacred event is, might be, okay, it's bare bones dictionary, but here's the sacrament is something else with the Roman church. A sacrament is the avenue of grace. Apart from that, there is no salvation. There is no forgiveness. And there are seven sacraments. There are only seven avenues by which you can touch the grace of God. Only seven avenues. Only seven. And who manages those seven? The priests do. The priest manages the seven. So the seven sacraments are important. They are holy events to them, but they are the, the, these are the ones by which the grace of God flows, and it does not flow outside of the seven sacraments. That's why these sacraments are considered to be these holy things. And it has to be this way. So what are those sacraments? Well, number one is baptism, okay? Only in baptism. So we have baptism, the application of water. But I want you to note something very carefully here. It is not, it is what they call baptismal regeneration. Do we teach baptismal regeneration? No. I do not teach baptismal regeneration. The Bible does not teach baptismal regeneration. What is baptismal regeneration? It is the application of water. Apart from belief, apart from repentance, it is magical, just as Sherry put it, what we call magical. It is power inherent in the water itself as the sacrament to be applied to a person. Power in the water itself. That's baptismal regeneration. That's why it's called a sacrament. So people say, well, you believe the Catholic doctrine of the baptism as being a sacrament. No, I do not. I oppose that. I oppose that in debate. I would oppose it in a debate tomorrow. I do, we oppose that. We've written about it. If I oppose that. I've always opposed that. But they mistake in necessary for salvation as baptismal regeneration. And that's one ac accusation that you're going to run into as you talk to people. Well, you believe in baptismal regeneration. No, you do not. Unless you believe that baptism, the application of water alone, apart from belief, apart from repentance, has power in itself to heal you from sins. And there's no power inherent in the water anyway. So it's not, so that's why baptism is considered to be a sacrament. So what are we going to have to do? If we're in the Catholic Church, we're going to have to put water on you. Sprinkle water. And is it going, are you going to believe? Not necessarily. If you're a baby, you can't. Are you going to repent? Not necessarily. 
You're going to have to have that baptism, though, and that's power in the water itself. Yes, sir. Yeah, so that's why they call, that's why they call it holy water, right? Uh, holy water, because the priest actually blesses it in the sense that there's something infused into the water that comes via the priesthood, and that's baptism becomes a sacrament. Here's another one, and that is the Lord's Supper. Is the Lord's Supper a sacrament? No. No, it's not a sacrament. The word sacrament, remember, carries the idea that inherently in itself, apart from how you live, it has power to regenerate you. So you can live like the devil out there, come in here, and you put that bread on your tongue, and you can take that fruit of the vine, and you have and that is power within itself. Is that true? No. This is so far from New Testament Christianity that it's shocking, but <clears throat> many people misunderstand all of this, and even in the Lord's church, they have misunderstandings regarding these things because they think, okay, if I can just get in there, take the Lord's Supper, I'll be all right. Well, how have you lived during the week? How have you lived during the week? Yes, ma'am. That's right. Yeah, they, they misunderstand because they misread, they don't read, they don't study, and so it becomes, becomes very confusing to them. All right, so here's another one. We'll look at this one, third one, and then we'll finish up right here on uh, number five. Uh, this is confirmation. What is confirmation? Confirmation. What is confirmation? Yeah, okay, so confirming. So the word would be mean confirming, but it is an official ceremony in which the priest blesses a child after this infant baptism, and this child is blessed through the life, and so it becomes has to be done by the priest because he has the power to confer. And confirmation becomes now a sacrament. You're dedicating that guy, uh, that child, to, to Christ. And that's how they put it. So a sacrament is confirmation. Confirmation is one of those sacraments. So we'll talk about the other ones uh, next week. Yes, sir. You know, I wanted to read one text. Uh, this is from, I thought this was so interesting. This is uh, The Rise of the Medieval Church by A.C. Flick. And I saw this passage in here, so I want you to listen to this. We'll finish right here. <clears throat> I want you to think about how we are today, how the church is today, and what was happening here at the time of Gregory the Great. And so he said, when Gregory the Great closed the remark his remarkable career, 604, we talked about that last week, the papacy, popedom, of the Middle Ages had been born and in form reestablished or resembled, it says, the empire because they adopted all the empire uh, structure of government. The head of the church was known as the Pope. Because of his peculiar personal holiness, he could be judged by none, though he himself judged of all. The hierarchy of officers had been practically completed. The laity was distinctly cut off from the clergy, deprived of powers exercised in the first and second centuries. The election of the clergy had changed from a democratic to an aristocratic process. That is, the leaders are going to choose the guys, and that's it. You don't have any say-so in it. There was a marked evolution, I get this, in the rites and ceremonies. An evolution. Art and music are now employed. What does he mean by music? He means instrumental music comes in. Get to that later. Art and music now become employed. The mass gradually became powerful, mysterious center of all worship while public worship became imposing, dramatic, and theatrical. Are we not close there in Protestant denominationalism and in community churches now? Isn't it dramatic, theatrical, musical? Isn't it the same thing? Aren't we, aren't we just doing, re, recreating history right here? So also, festivals were multiplied almost without number. The worship of martyrs and saints became so widespread and popular that a calendar of saints was, was formed. Pilgrimages grew to be very numerous, and the use of relics developed such a craze that the fathers, councils, popes, and at last the emperor himself sought to check it. They had to stop it. Religious pageants were multiplied. The use of images and pictures of the saints were encouraged in the churches, and the Virgin Mary was exalted to an eminence of divinity. This is what happens when you have the centralized government, and that's how it went. And so because of that, we're going to see instrumental music brought in as well. 
remember Brother Foy Wallace would say this, when you see churches that use instrumental music and the theatrical performances in church, in worship, we haven't got out of the front yard of Catholicism. We haven't got out of the front yard. That's what we're going to be because that's where it came from. All right, anything to say as we conclude? Dramatic note on which to stop. <laughs> Thank you for your participation.